Hello and welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. We are here to talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. On today's episode, we have an interview with Henry Gaiden, writer of the new film, There's Someone Inside Your House. It doesn't make sense, you know? Why would the killer go after Jackson? Got secrets. Careful out there, friend. Crazy people in this town. Uh, I have a secret. I accidentally ran over a hitchhiker and dumped his body into the ocean. Is that bad? I just want to live. Shit, there's someone wearing Rodrigo's face! just are who you are. You don't have any secrets. You can't hide anything anymore. But Connie, I know who you are. Whatever little game this is, whatever you think you know, you don't know shit! You know my secret. Guest host Charday Sellers and Henry discussed his process when adapting something from existing material, his approach to writing younger characters, his work on the film Shazam, and more. Check it out. Welcome back to Write On, everyone. Charday here again, and I'm so excited to talk to this next writer, Henry Gaiden of There's Someone Inside Your House, currently streaming on Netflix. Hi, Henry. Hi, Charday. That was good. It's a haunting voice. Work. Yeah. Oh, oh, I quit. I quit Final Draft. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm moving on to voiceover work. There's someone inside your house. As Henry told me I was good yeah. at it. So yeah. that's all I need. First of all, I want to, for the listeners, I do want to do like a brief overview of you because I have to gush about this really quick. I know it's not related to there's someone inside the house, but we'll get to that because there's time. I love Shazam so much. So do I. <laughs> so, so much. And, okay. and which is really funny because I avoided it for so long. I was like, I don't want to see another superhero film. I'm over this. Like I'm done. And, and even though I'm wearing a Marvel shirt today, <laughs> don't tell anyone. And then I actually saw it, not in the theaters. I rented it when I was at home and I was like, I really wish I went to see this in the movie theaters because this is sensational. You know what was, well, thank you. First of all, I, I'm also tired of superhero movies and I loved, I loved working on it and making both of them. And, and what was really fun, the only thing you maybe missed about the movie theater experience was, was the first week of it, when it came out, people reacting to the climax when, spoiler, all the kids get yeah. what they get. And, uh, and just why I've never had it happen in a movie I've written where everyone's just like, what the? Oh, like yeah, just like, yeah. the, like a like a sort of wave of like joy and elation hits everyone at the same time and it was so fun to watch that was yes cool. i will say me and my dog though were astounded at home i'm just <laughs> like this is so cool and so funny and so poignant i was excited to talk to you today because i'm really interested to know how someone jumps from a movie like shazam into a horror film like that but i can also see the thread between them because you what you do very well if you don't mind me saying is you write kids, teenagers, younger people (laughs) very well and a very believable voice. It doesn't sound like someone who is not, you know, who's an adult trying to write for them. It it sounds like an authentic voice. So my first question is, how do you do that? Teach me because I'm only 32, but I still feel so out of touch with anyone younger than me. I'm like, what's the, what's the cool words you guys are saying? What do y'all like nowadays? Yeah. I mean, look, I'm, I'm dangerously close from being too old to do this anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really tipped. I'm in fact, I said, I'm doing a project right now where I, I was like, this is the last movie I ever write in a high school. I just can't, I can't, oh. you know what I mean? But like, but I'll, t- I'll tell you, there's no secret. And I think some people may think I, I, some, some Gen Z kids may be like, this doesn't sound, you know, authentic at all. And that may be true. But, um, but to me, like I, um, I was an assistant to a writer for many years and he had a grandson and like when the grandson was like six, maybe five, um, his, he went up to, he, he was visiting his grandfather and I worked at his grandfather's house. And he said to his mom, like, um, I really like Henry because he looks me in the eyes when he talks to me, like, and so like, and I know that sounds like a strange comparison, but it's like, if you just don't try and talk down, you know, yeah. you just try and like look a character in the eyes and let them speak like an adult would speak just with all the insecurities that may be going on when they're young and teenagers. I don't know, like eighth grade also that great movie by Bo Burnham, like yeah, 
adults can identify with that character, even though she's in eighth grade and just full of all these insecurities because she's kind of the raw version of what we all are now. She's just got everything showing and we just cover it up. So that's um, sort of a very indirect way of saying I just try and approach them like people. Oh, no, I love that. And especially because I do remember being that age and thinking back on it. I was like, wow, you were much smarter than you give yourself. Right. You weren't just like some 14 year old girl. You were very, yeah. very in tune with yourself. And yeah. <laughs> for some yeah. reason, when we watch shows starring teenagers, we dumb them down. Like they're so naive and not aware of what's happening in the world. Yeah, it's, it's like really easy to do that. And I think in some ways I was much smarter than I am now. And then there are lots of things where I was just a, a goddamn idiot, too. Like there's a line and I don't know if I can curse, but like there's a line and there's someone inside your house, which I said at one point in my life, like I was like 17 and I was like, it took me 20 years to be like, that's hilarious that I said that with a straight face. Like, <laughs> like where um, Ali is, says he's smoking a cigarette and he says like, it's nice to know we can control the way we die. You know, like when he's like, why do you still smoke? <laughs> yeah. And I said that as a 17 year old to some girl, like, and like, like at the time I, I totally meant it. And then like, suddenly I was writing the script and I was like, that's so funny. And this guy means it, you know, like. It. And they're so prolific. I think we're also, we were, I was so much braver back then. I oh want to fuck up for people immediately. And now I'm like, mind your business. Let's just keep quiet. Let's keep it moving. But yeah, I was like, I'm so much more meek than I used to be. Like, I just yeah. like, like, even like in work, I would just be, I would just charge in and be like, I'm a writer and I want to, I want to show you what I can do. And now I'm like, just sort of in the corner being like, yeah, it's okay. You don't have to look at me. I'm a writer. Do you want to try to read my work? Which I, know. <laughs> I understand. I understand. No, no, I wouldn't want to read it either. Yeah. Right. No, you're right. It's something like, it's like when you start adulting, the world beats you into submission, but that, that what I love about your work, especially, and there's someone inside your house is that these are fully formed characters who know who they are, yeah. even though they're struggling to do, you know, they're struggling period in the movie, but I, it just reminded me of my younger self. And I was like, you, you had it together, girl. Why do you sometimes look back on that? Like you didn't, you didn't know everything that's for true, but you no. did pretend like you did. You were really good at that. <laughs> pretending but, like you know everything. Another thing I've really been thinking about a lot recently because we live in a world of like truth and truth deniers and all this stuff. But as a teenager, like, do you remember like how you would just hear some bullshit story from someone that you didn't, you could not confirm. And yeah. then you would just pass it on to everyone you knew as if it was just truth. Like yeah. I was doing press for this movie in Austin, Texas, where we had our premiere and I went to school in Austin, Texas. That's where I went to college. And there's a dorm there called Jester. And I was talking to someone we were doing press with. And I was talking about how Jester dorm was built by this Russian architect um, who only built prisons. And then this one dorm, it's huge. It looks like a prison. And as I was saying that out loud for the first time since I was in college, I was like, you know what? This sounds like bullshit. <laughs> and, uh, and she was like, it kind of does. And then I looked it up and it's, and you go Jester dorm Wikipedia and it goes prevalent. Like the, the most pervasive, like urban legend is that this was built by a Russian architect who only built prisons. And I was like, I said that I, I went to college for four years and I just told everyone that like I well, in it. full confidence from the, yeah. the bravado of the chest. Like, and no, that, this happened. Yeah. And that's like a thing that young people can do that I can't do anymore. Like if someone says, yeah, like, if my wife's like, I'm going to put the sushi in the fridge for tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't think you should do that. You know, and then she'll be like, no, I mean, it's, it's going to be OK. I'll be like, all right. Well, I, I don't trust myself. You probably know better. Like, I don't I don't like okay, we're not pushing back, which is interesting because I'm wondering while you're crafting the characters in this movie. I mean, it actually is a great tool, too, because the trope and horror, as we know, is no one believes the kids or the women. Right or anyone yeah. who yeah. says something's happening. I want to know how this is an adaptation from a book. It is. Okay. So what does that process look like when you're adapting, e even for Shazam too? Like that's obviously based off of a, a character that DC has had for a while. So what is your process when it comes to adapting something that's already been created before you got there? Well, the, these Shazam's really different from the, this adaptation. Um, mm -hmm. Shazam was um, adapted from uh, the new 52 comic line that Jeff Johns did. Mm. And um, when, in, in those original new 52s that he did, Black Adam is in that story. Mm. So when I came on board, we were directly adapting that and Dwayne was still on the movie. Mm. And then about a little less than a year into my work on it, they split the movies. Yeah. And Black Adam became its own thing because it was too many, too many things in one movie. But it really was a pretty... When I came in, Darren Lim Limke had done a draft. So he had already kind of put the foundation of the comic into a screenplay form. 
So really that was our, the work was already done and I could just okay. build, build on it and just, and just, and just kind of go in a lot of fun directions for me. Um, so that, that was a little different. And Jeff is a producer on the movie. So like I could always go to Jeff Johns and just talk to him. Like he, he has such a good feel for that character in that world. Like, and if I yeah. ever kind of went slightly astray, he'd be like, I don't think this is exactly the tone, you know? Um, yeah. I did a lot of, in my early going, I did a lot of heavy research on foster sort of homes and group homes. And, um, you know, and I, I like, I think I, I went a little to, um, what's that Brie Larson movie? Um, oh, room? Not room. No, no, no. The, the like, one, there's, there's one in a group home. <laughs> yeah. Room. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Could you imagine Shazam oh featuring room? <laughs> Short term 12. Short -term oh, okay. 12. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I went like a little too realistic and, okay. uh, and he was like, no, 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 That's not, that's not what we're doing here. You know? Yeah. And so, um, so I always had Jeff there as a resource. This adaptation is, was unique because I'd never adapted a book before. And I love horror movies, but I've never, I've always liked slasher movies, but they've been kind of my least favorite subgenre of the of the whole genre because um, you never really get really emotionally invested in them. Yeah, you know, like, I mean, obviously, Scream, Scream's a masterpiece, and I love most of the sequels, but I'm just those are kind of few and far between. I watched like 160 slasher movies before I started writing, oh, wow. and a lot of it's just junk, you know. Some of it's great, yeah. but a lot of it's junk, and none of it you really walk away being like, "Man, I love those characters." That's not what you do, especially because you're writing a movie where they're going to be killed. So. What I loved and responded to about that book, um, Stephanie Perkins' book, was um, she comes from a YA romance background. It was her first horror book. So she created all these characters that were great, and I love them. And there was a love story inside of this slasher book, and I really responded to it. And I just, because I was emotionally invested, I suddenly wanted to write a slasher movie, you know, because, and then, but but what she had in the book was was a, um, a killer who wore a hoodie. And it wasn't the killer that we have in our movie. And um, and there was really nothing particularly special about him. And because there's so many slasher movies, I wanted to find some other way um, into it. And so then I came up with this idea of like, how do you have set pieces that have emotional stakes for the the victims? Not just like, I need to run and slash and stalk, like not visceral thrills, but actually like, if I die, the worst thing about me will be known to everyone. So yeah. I, I have to survive. So now it's an emotional set piece in some ways too. And so then I thought like if the killer is wearing a mask of their face and then some of your face with yourself. And then I was like, oh, okay. And so once I put that layer that onto what she had already written, I was in love. And that's where we jumped off from there. What is the what is your workflow process looking like? Are you reading the book? Are you taking note card notes? Are you like how do you pick and choose? Like, I want to import this element from the book because um, I think this is important. Yeah. Well, so I, this is the first time I've done it. I've only done it once since. But what I did is I read the book uh, once just because I didn't know if I want to do it. And then once I agreed to, I read it again. And then I started, I created a document with all the facts of Osborne, Nebraska, because she went and, and stayed in Nebraska and, and traveled around and really kind of absorbed the atmosphere of of that part of the country. And so I took all the facts from population numbers to what stores there were, to what kind of like, you know, architecture there was and cornfields and farms and just everything. And then have a document of what Osborne is. And then I took my favorite scenes from her book. And this was the most instructive thing and a meet and just faithfully adapted them in final draft. So I just started almost transcribing the book into final draft and then obviously shortening it because it's a briefer form. Right. Medium, and, uh, and then just feeling what her words felt like on a screenplay page. And then from there, I was able to start kind of building my own character work and, and scenes and going from there. But so that's honestly laying that foundation did a lot for me. And then also, you know, I think because I stray from the book, I would not say a lot, but a fair amount. Mm -hmm. The foundation of it was always kind of Stephanie's sort of core right and so what was really really cool is that you know a year after i'd after i'd started we turned in the draft to stephanie who she you know she didn't have like any final say it was just out of respect to see right. what she thought and i was pretty nervous and uh and she she said she said basically the nicest thing anyone could say she said that like if she'd had two more years to work on the book this would have been what she would have wanted to do like so wow. she's she still felt connected to it. She felt like the characters were speaking true to what she'd done, but also like it had gone in a different direction that still somehow felt faithful to her. So that was really sweet. That's honestly the best compliment you can get. Yeah, <laughs> from it someone. is. 
because I know our audience so well, and I know they're going to ask me this question. Do you ever consider putting up any of these past note buildings or scenes or any of your past screen works on a website or something for people to look at? What do you mean? Sorry, what do you like my scripts or yeah. or, or scenes? Or- Scenes, scripts, your past research. And what I know about our listeners at Final Draft is they're all writers. They're all they're all working sure. writers or want to be working writers. And a lot of them go, well, we really would want to read the script to this movie or we want to see like the note cards, the outline. And I know John August does it on his website okay. all the time. Yeah. But I'm asking because I know I'm going to get letters. Would you ever consider putting up like the screenplay for this or Shazam for people to read? Well, I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to it. I always thought I never have because I don't own those scripts, Warner Brothers. So let's say the Shazam That's scripts, true. Warner Brothers owns them. So Warner Brothers owns it. So I think if I do put it up, they get pissed. I could be wrong, <laughs> but I don't, Netflix may be different, but I certainly am open to throwing up scenes. And, you know, I, you know, I got permission when um, when Black Lives Matter was happening and uh, to post some deleted scenes from Shazam one to let people donate. Um, however, they saw fit last year. Oh, that's amazing. So like I got they gave me permission to post those deleted scenes on my Instagram, but I've never like posted outside of that any of my work. Not that I'm opposed to it. Yeah, I'm down. I just. I I think people would have to ask me what, tell me what they wanted. And then I find it. You hear that? If you're listening, you're on Twitter. I saw you, you can find him on Twitter and and request what you would like. Ask Um, ask away. Yeah. yeah. Let me, I want to ask you about your workflow because every writer is different. And I love to hear what their day of writing looks like. You have a child. Yes. Someone's in your house. (laughs) What does that look like as a parent? Like how, when you are on a deadline and you also have to be a parent at the same time. Oh my gosh. I'm such a new parent. I don't know if I have a great answer for that. That is a great question though. I mean, really just the priority is her. So I just like, whatever has to happen has to happen. Um, But I don't have like actually a really solid attack plan. It's just, just get it done when you can and then be there for your kid. So so sometimes that means me staying up late, you know, sometimes that means me pushing a deadline a few days, but I've never met any kind of um, resistance to that, you know, especially if your kid needs your help, needs you. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I know a lot of uh, parents I've spoken to are like, I'm up at 5 a.m. It's the best time. I'm not a parent, so I can't I can't judge that at all. Nope, but I, I can't do that. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, it doesn't sound like something I would do. I, oh, I, I know I, I knew a writer who used to get up at 4 a.m. every day and write until his kids got up for breakfast. And then he went off and did a, to do another job. So he would write from four to like 630 every day. Amazing. That's amazing. I know I, I'd rather stay up late at night and be tired than wake up early and be tired. I want to ask you about this feature writing versus um, from streaming versus theatrical. So Mm -hmm. there's someone in your house is exclusively on Netflix right now streaming. And then obviously Shazam did a theatrical run. Is there a difference when you're writing any of these projects, depending on where they're going to come out for you at least, or at least in the processes are different and note taking or the notes you get back or the, the scheduling. Not at all, actually. No, the only difference is how it's felt when it comes out. You know, like, Mm -hmm. but like, but not, not in the least bit. It's an interesting question, but no, I, it felt exactly the same. You know, I, I think she's the only difference would be like maybe the budget level. So like the, obviously the budget of Shazam and Shazam two is much bigger than there's someone inside your house. So when you're dealing with a movie on that level, you're dealing with a much larger involvement in a studio, you know? So the notes are coming from, everywhere particularly on the sequel you know like and it, it wasn't bad it was just felt you know like this yeah. is a, it's an expensive property they need to make good on their investment we got to check everything in every department and make sure everyone's seen and heard and netflix was because it's a small smaller budget it would have been the same way if it was a new line small budget yeah. film um it was just a small group of people making a movie and honestly the first shazam even though it was expensive kind of felt like that too because no one knew who shazam was what this right. movie was we kind of kind of snuck through the system and made a movie with about six people working on it throughout, like just the director and the producers and executives and me. And it was great, but no, honestly, it, it, I think it just felt like the budget level. That's the only difference, but yeah, it's exactly the same. Have you, have you heard differently? No, I haven't, but I'm so interested in the future, just of the feature world, especially I interview a lot of TV writers and, yeah. and that's pretty much the same, honestly, sure. but for the future of feature writers, I know there's feature writers who listen to this podcast and they're probably like, yes, ask these questions. What do you have? It, what's advice for feature writers, people who don't want to write for TV, who solely want to write for features. It feels like the landscape is a little like 
impossible to get into because it's such a small pool, especially because TV is now the thing and there's just more jobs. Like how did you always want to write and feature solely or do you ever want to go into TV? I did only want to write feature solely. I, I kind of think that's biting me in the ass because there's like a, a appetite for adventurous storytelling in TV. And, and I don't think that's happening. I mean, though streaming is really opening those possibilities up, it's not happening in features as much, you know? Yeah. The one regret I would have about being stuck in features is you have to follow the template so closely. And like, and I remember I watched, um, did you see Malignant? Oh, yes. Loved yeah, it. So, me too. And like, and I was like watching Malignant and I was like, fuck, can we do this? Right. Can we, like, <laughs> can we like shift genres every 15 minutes? And like, and like in a great way. And then like, and just like all the bonkers shit that that movie was doing yeah. and I was here for I was just I was blown away and I, and I literally said that out loud to the screen by myself I was like can we do these things like we're allowed to do this James yeah. never told me this I know <laughs> I was like can I go can I go can I do this crazy shit and so anyway so I um I you do feel a little more hemmed in whereas I think TV really now at least through the writers I know that are, are really encouraged to just explore the wildest, craziest thoughts they have and go make those movies and go with those shows. So I, to answer your question in a roundabout way, I've always focused on features. That's kind of always been my love, not TV. I would love to get into TV for the reasons I just told you, but there's something about like the commit. If like, if I were to create a show, which God knows if anyone would want it, but if I did, like there's something about the commitment to that, that kind of scares me because movies, like I always kind of I have a very kind of um, what's the kind of full weddings and a funeral term for it, um, a serial monogamist relationship right. with movies where like, if I agree to write, adapt a book or adapt a comic or, or write a movie, I'm committing to two to three years of my life because I, unless they fire me, which is fine. It hasn't happened yet, but like, if, unless they fire me, I want to see it through from the beginning to the end. So I want to yeah. be on set. I want to be in post. I want to do ADR. Like I want to be, Oh, I just want to have my hands on it in every way that I'm invited to be involved. So already do that with movies. I can't imagine the commitment for TV. So that's a, a thing that scared me. So that's, that's answering some of your questions. You also asked me for advice about yeah. getting into features. I don't know if I have good advice. I feel like I've been in this. I've been lucky enough to have been in this for about 10 years and I can tell you how I got into it, but it's gotten worse. Like, so I got in like right after 2008 when it shrunk significantly, it's always just the same, which is you have to write a spec. I'll tell you what I did. This is the best way to, is I, I was an assistant to a writer for many years. And then eventually I wrote a spec and I'd written scripts about five before then, but I wrote a spec. I could tell this was different and a different level than like everything else I'd written. Like I kind of prepared and worked my way to this place. I wrote that script and I could tell it was different. And I never really asked people for favors or, or help getting a representative. I just emailed everyone I knew in LA like yeah. even kind of new, like even kind of just like kind of tangentially new and wrote a very like earnest thing saying like, look, I wrote the script. I'm really proud of it. And I was, and I'm looking for any help to get an agent or manager to read it. Um, and if you read it and like it, I love your help. And if not all good. And I sent specific personalized emails to like 50 people. Mm -hmm. And then of those 50, 25 wrote back and said, sure, I'd love to read it. And of the 25, like 12 liked it you know, and of the 12 that helps only one got me to an agent, but it worked. Yeah. Like, and so, and all these other people, these agents and managers who'd read it in the interim, like would say 11 others wrote back and said like, no, not for me. Someone actually wrote back just a link, how to write a screenplay. I was like, Oh, Damn. wow. <laughs> Damn. I don't know why my friend sent me that by the way, but she forwarded it to me. Uh, oh, wow. Ooh, you're very know, brave in 2008. Yeah. And so then, uh, and then, you know, all these, 11, uh, you know, a couple were like, Hey, look, this is good work, but you know, why don't you just get back in touch with us when you have another script? Like it wasn't for them. Right. Right. And this Jason Burns, my, my still agent at UTA, when he said, yes, I want to represent you. Almost all of the other representatives who said no came back and said, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Like, That's and so it. they just needed someone else to legitimize it. You know, and, and that was really instructive and made me feel a little better. Two questions before we wrap up. The first one is where is that spec script now that got you your agent? Where does it live on your computer? That script is called Golden Mean and it lives sort of on my computer. It, it had producers and, and possibly cast attached briefly, but it just never really took off. And okay. everyone told me if it was pre 2008, 
it's a kind of like Alexander Payne ish type of movie that would have gotten made, but they're like, no one's going to make this movie anymore. Yeah. But I really, I really appreciate you being honest about that because I'm a firm believer that not everything that you write is going to get made, nor should it. Sometimes it just functions as a connector to get you a job or an agent or something like that. I mean, yeah, yeah. And you know, a, a great example of that is I wrote a script. So I, I basically had this idea when I was making Art to Echo at Disney before Disney sold it. Mm -hmm. where the director, Dave Green, and I came up with this killer idea. We loved it. And we pitched it around town in so many iterations. At some point, it was a found footage. At other points, it wasn't. But it was always the same core story. And and no one ever wanted it. And and then I went and met uh, Walt Tomato when he worked at New Line Cinema. He was eventually now the head of DC. He was at New Line. And uh, I had a general meeting with him because he liked Art Echo. And, uh, And I was like, hey, man, can I pitch you a like a loosely pitch you a movie. And he was like, yeah, we don't really buy like pitches, but sure. And so I pitched him like a one minute pitch of that movie. And he was like, okay, we're going to buy them. We'll we'll make that movie. (laughs) That's the one. (laughs) And so, and so, and then, but it was a micro budget movie. You know, it was back when they were doing very, very micro budget movies as an experiment. And so it was going to cost about a million bucks. So my, my pay was going to be nothing. And so all of my reps, I mean, I never had a, maybe not since all of my reps, including my lawyer, call me up all at once to say, you should not do this, you know? And I was like, but I, but I want to tell this story, you know? Yeah. And they're like, it's a terrible deal. And it was, I guess, but whatever. I was like, I want to tell the story. I don't give a shit. Yeah. Um, and then I went and back and told my wife and she was like, why do you want to tell the story? And like, I told her and she's like, I don't, I don't know if I get it. And I was like, Oh God. So I felt so alone. And then I wrote that script and I still love it. They have not made it, but that is exactly why they thought of me for Shazam. There you go. So because I wrote all these kids in this summer camp, they were like, this guy knows how to write like comedy and like humor, but like tension and set pieces. And like, and so I would, I would never have gotten Shazam if I hadn't written that script for pennies on the dollar. I love that. That's exactly the reality of it. And I really do believe people need to hear that. I know it sucks because everyone's like, everything I have is going to get made and it's not, but I, it uh, maybe I really yeah. want to, I want to see that movie now. Um, it's so good. I can't, they keep every year. They're like, we're going to make it this year. And I'm like, I don't believe you anymore, but I, but I really hope they do. I'm but. excited for it because I do want to see you continue in the horror genre because I do think you have a voice that's similar to Kevin Williamson for me, where it's like, you just get this niche of like kid, the kids, I'm 32, teenagers and angst and, and adolescents, but also fear and, and suspense and thriller. So I really hope you do continue down that lane and they make this next movie and you continue to do that. With that said, I have one question left because I've held you hostage long enough. The kid is coming for you. I can just feel it. 20 month year old. Oof. <laughs> What advice would you give your younger writer self? And that could be, you know, that person at in 2008 or the person right before you you wrote Shazam or before this movie, but just something that you have to offer your younger writer self that you wish you had known then. There's a lot of things that it could be a good answer there. (laughs) And and honestly, lessons I'm still learning, like as of this week, you know, like I I think first and foremost, and I sort of knew this then, but it's I think it's proven true even more as I've gotten older, like don't be in a rush. You know, I think there's so much pressure, especially when when someone gets out of college and they're like, okay, now I'm going to have these scripts and I'm going to send this all these people and I'm just going to I'm going to get an agent and and just really relax, like move out here or, or honestly, the town may have changed after the pandemic, maybe you don't even need to move out here anymore. Just write, like get to know people, like create a sort of world for yourself in writing. Moving to LA, at least when I did, it was really important. I worked on at a production company as an assistant. I worked for executives as an assistant. I worked for a writer on uh, Spider-Man 3, that Sam Raimi movie. And I got to see that movie, like a huge, like $300 million movie, like from pre-production to post and like learning so much. And then, and just... All of those moments were so instructive and I was reading so many scripts and I was becoming a better writer. And I think a lot of people are in a rush to succeed right away when they're just not mature enough, um, I think mentally and also as a writer to handle, to handle what you got to go through. Cause then even once you get an agent, it's just fucking tough, you know, like it's rough. Like you gotta, you gotta know how to take notes 
and you got to know how to take understand what the note underneath the note is you got to like be able to read a room you got to be able to socialize and be like a sociable person which we're writers which we're not you know but you got to learn to be that you got to learn how to pitch in a room like you're some fucking salesman i'm sorry i'm cursing so much but you got to like pitch that's not something i ever thought i'd have to do as a writer you know but yeah. now i now i love it like now it's like sitting around a campfire and telling people a story that I want to tell them. So it's like a different kind of storytelling that I never thought I'd like, but it took me years to get good at, you know? And the way I do it, my wife, I said, is also a writer. She does it completely differently. And like, there's just different ways you got to find out how you do every little bit of this process. So I would say, don't be in a rush. No, I think that's, that's sound advice as someone who's constantly, our whole life is built around being, is is rushing, it's rushing for deadlines, rushing yeah. for coffee and the pandemic at least for me stay at home really stopped everything in my life to go oh wow why are you rushing look at what happens the world happens and then you have no choice but to slow down yeah (laughs) totally yeah that i love that i love that advice especially when you said mentally you're not quite there yeah i'm a huge believer that you have to have some sort of therapy and know yourself very well That's exactly right yeah my 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 old boss who i work for um alvin said um as a, as a writer's assistant, he said something that I, I think about all the time. He said a lot of things, but he was like, your twenties are figuring out who you are. Your thirties are you knowing who you are and, and sort of enjoying it and succeeding in it. And your forties, are you being able to relax? Carrie um, Shaw said that on sex in the city. So you yeah. took that. I wonder if he took it from him. I wonder if this 80 year old man <laughs> watched sex in the city and took that. But, um, no, I mean, I, I, I just, I think that's true because it's so, it's, it's a little scary to put yourself out there and be vulnerable and be in rooms and as a writer and, and just to not know who you are on top of all that is rough. It's really rough. And with that said, Henry, thank you so much for an awesome episode. I really love episodes like this because the listeners want to hear the technical stuff about writing, especially for films that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I really think you gave feature writers a lot of gems and a lot of reality and fact-based information because we're not doing that anymore. Remember, we're not passing around (laughs) bad information. This is real stuff. He he was a Russian architect, all prisons. (laughs) I was a Russian architect. So Henry Gaiden, I'm so excited to have you on the show and I'm excited to have met a new friend. Everyone, there's someone inside your house is currently streaming on Netflix. You can watch it right now. I've seen it and I don't want to spoil anything because it's not that kind of podcast, but I do think it will subvert your expectations if you are a slasher fan like myself. And I can't believe we're bringing back the slasher genre. Right. Bring it back. It's my favorite. <laughs> what a year for slasher movies. It's what bananas. a year. Exactly. Bananas. It's bananas. We just had Halloween kills, screams coming out. Like yeah. I'm ready. That's it's my favorite genre. So um, Henry, thank you so much. Stick around. I want to give you a little parting goodbye, but everyone else will be back for another episode very, very soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks to Henry Gaiden and as always to Sade Sellers. There's Someone Inside Your House is streaming right now on Netflix. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about new episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and on Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This podcast was produced by Kayla Guess and co-produced by Emma Vranich. Editing is by Sean Bonnet. Music is by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Mm